Super Center Podcast with Sam Bakhtiar, bringing you the 1% knowledge to help you reach your full potential. Learn what it takes to rise above the 99% and become a 1%er. All right, guys, welcome to the One Percenter Podcast. Again, on my show, I have Dr. Saman Soleimani, somebody who I have so much respect for, an internal medical doctor, you know, with, you know, he's going to talk about all his credentials. I mean, I can't even go on and on about everything that he's achieved in life. And like I said before, he's someone who I, I met over the internet. He has the same first name. You know, he likes the same kind of cars. Matter of fact, before we got on this podcast, all we talked about was cars and we can talk for hours. You know, he has, you know, he, he's, he's married, he has kids, just like I do. He has a black German shepherd, just like I do. And oh my God, man, this is like- Similarities are kind of, the similarities, similarities are kind of scary, I have to say. I was thinking about that the other day. I was like, what the hell? This is crazy. This is like a brother <laughs> I never had. So, Doug, last time I had you on the show, you know, you brought so much knowledge about Thank hormone you. optimization, you know, and, and being healthy and building muscle and losing body fat. And, and, you know, how to look at different lab works and what they mean, you know, but, you know, towards the end, you know, after we got off, we talked about the diets, yes. you know, and all the different fads on the diets and all that kind of stuff. And, and, you know, there's this fad going on right now, man, everybody's been you know, jumping on a bandwagon. Every time I turn around, somebody's talking about they're vegan, you know, and, and all that they start talk about is like, they, they talk about, you know, that, that movie, the game changers, you know, which, which, you know, and all that it's, it's crazy. Like it just went viral and everybody and their mother now, is, is vegan it's kind of like when we had the low carb craze and then the low yes. fat craze you know yes. all these crazes just are coming and going and it's crazy so let's talk about that i want i want you to talk Absolutely. about that i want you to tell me your view on yeah, it so i want to i want to start off because this will ruffle a lot of feathers and we talked about this like some people are just not going to be happy with what i'm going to say but before we get to that i like to just start out and this is me extending an olive branch by saying I love plant foods, right? This is not about, this, this topic that we're gonna to discuss today is not about whether um, having plants in your diet is bad or it's a bad thing, or even veganism is bad or being vegetarian is bad. It, this is not that discussion. And I'll, I'll say myself, if you, from the time I wake up in the morning till I go to sleep, if I just, everything that I ate, we had a copy of that and we threw it in a, in a box or a trash bag or something. And we waited at the end of the day, probably by weight, 85 to 90% of what I consume is plants, right? So that by itself should calm the nerve just a little bit, right? This is not about plants are bad, vegetables are bad. This is about this notion and pseudoscience that keeps getting thrown out that animal proteins are bad, right? So this is not about plants are bad. This is me defending that, oh my God, veganism is the only way to salvation. Without it, you're gonna get fat, have cancer, be weak, have arthritis, and all the things that they talk about, right? So that's kind of the issue is, and I wholeheartedly believe that if you want to have a healthy lifestyle, if you want to live long-term and reduces your chances of long-term illness on many different levels, that a majority of your food should be plant-based, right? So that is, the question is not about that. So hopefully having said that out the onset, that calms um, some fear mongering that some people yeah, have not, that I'm coming here we're saying, not, we're not we should have slabs of cheesy. Say that again? The one thing I learned doc is first day, nutrition 101 at Penn State, you know, and my professor said, a variety of foods, from a variety of different sources, variety of different colors, and don't eat anything you didn't find in your grandma's cabinet. You know, Boom. and it all comes exactly. back to that. You know, and and you know, I'm just gonna say, but I so we're not. I, you know, I'm not ever going to say this is bad. This is bad. I just think we need all kinds of different foods as long as they come from natural sources. Sure. One. Th so what I wanted to start with was just about, and this is you know what we're going to talk about today. This has nothing to do about religion. This is nothing to do about ethics humanistic. Uh, this is not about, I'm not going to discuss, you know, carbon emission and 
effects on the environment. Like this, is, this goes beyond the topic of today. This is about what should a human being, and again, the reason I say human being, because they will correlate well, gorillas eat lots of plants and they're muscular. Maybe we should eat them. Well, I don't know. Last time I looked, I don't look like a gorilla. My physiology is not a gorilla. So what happens is there's a lot of causation and you know they'll just jump to conclusion like, hey, cows eat grass and cows have meat. So why? Let's just skip the middleman and just eat grass. Well, it doesn't quite work out that way, right? You know, that, that's not how real science and medicine and nutrition works. But to just talk about not even physiology, but straight anatomy uh, initially. If we look at all different organisms on this planet, just by studying their anatomy, you're able to confidently determine what is their daily diet entails, correct? Um, you know, so we have, you know, typically we have obligate herbivores, we have omnivores and we have obligate carnivores. Now on either extreme, what's an um, ob obligate herb the herbivore? You know, a cow, let's just say, right? Simple. An obligate carnivore, a tiger, a lion, a cheetah, a dog, cat. So, and herbivores are in between that can consume both. Now, the major difference anatomically you know, and we can sit there and talk about what's good for you and what's not good for you. But if you look at uh, an obligate herbivore, their jaw structure is completely different. So for example, you look at a cow, um, the way their mandibular joints and their jaw are designed is allowed to give the maximal side to side movement. Um, they have no uh, premolars, they don't have incisors, they don't have any of the sharp teeth that we have up front because they literally have molar teeth, like tabletop teeth from front to back. And their jaw goes only side to side. That's essentially their main movement. And by you looking at that, you can tell this person is not meant to tear a chunk of meat and eat it. They're, because they have molar teeth, their job is crushing and masticating plants. Obviously, and again, we're still talking about anatomy, not even physiology. You look at the anatomical structure of their digestive system. They have four chambers in their stomach. They're not even close to obligate carnivores or omnivores in their digestive tract anatomically. Now you look at my cat, my Bengal cat, or a tiger or a wolf, their jaw works like a scissor. Go take your pay, favorite pair of shears and try to do this with it. It doesn't work unless it's really worn out. What is a scissor supposed to do? Go, just go straight up and down in a chopping motion. If you don't believe me, go grab your dog, go grab your cat, grab their bottom jaw, see if you can even wiggle it a little bit. It doesn't move. They have no molar teeth. Their teeth are all sharp, they just go from sharp to sharper to sharper. And they're meant, so when you look at that, when you look at a cheetah, when you look at a tiger, when you look at the claws they have, you look at the teeth structure they have, you look at how their jaw mechanism works, which is how they eat, we can tell this animal is meant to chomp, tear meat and flesh. There's no way you can look at that dental structure and say, they're supposed to eat soybean, right? I mean, just if I said that, now imagine if some group came, which we talked about this now, there are people like, hey, we should feed dogs plant-based material, like plant-based. Like, it's ludicrous. You can't, and this doesn't even matter whether you believe in a higher power, like you believe God, like let's say forget evolution, okay? If, if you believe in God, then you have to ask yourself, why did God create this jaw and teeth structure if they're not meant to have that? And if you believe in evolution or any other form of why we're here today, same thing. We, those animals would not be here today if that's not what they were meant to consume. Now, you take um, an omnivore like us, we have both. We have canines up front, we have incisors and sharp that's meant to you know, chop and tear things, but we also have molar teeth. Yeah, we have premolars that start to flap, 
flatten out and we have molars in the back that are meant for mastication. When we look at the enzymes we have in our body, we can tell, now we're going into physiology, we can tell we have specific proteolytic enzymes from our pancreas, from our stomach, from our small intestines that are there. They're, they're, they're there not to break down starches. They're not there to break down soy protein and pea protein. They're there to extract and digest animal protein and animal fat. So the question is, why are they there? Again, if you want to talk about a higher power or evolution, either way, we have this. You know, what we can't, you know, an obligate herbivore like a cow has specific bacteria. Literally, they have specific bacteria in their guts, in their digestive system. They have specific enzymes that breaks down cellulose. We do not have that. The only thing we get out of plants is by chewing and mastication and getting some of their good stuff out in the process of literally chewing and tearing them up. We don't have enzymes that breaks down cellulose like herbivores do. So to somehow suggest that despite us lacking certain key physiologic enzymes and chemicals that requires you to be an obligate herbivore and come say, listen, forget about all that. We know it doesn't matter. You should just eat plants anyways. That's where the issue comes in. That's where it becomes kind of pseudoscience. So I wanted to kind of get that out first is we can look back and based on just anatomy of different organisms, you know, you can look at, if I showed you a bird that has really long, thin legs, that's two feet long and has a really long pointy beak, it doesn't take a genius to figure out that that's the type of bird that's going to be in shallow waters and it's got a two foot long stem legs because it wants to get out of the water quickly. Their feet are not webbed because they don't need to swim. They want to be able to lift their foot out of the water as quickly as possible. And the reason they have really long pointy beaks is because they pick up the little you know, mackerels or shrimps or whatever out the bottom of the ocean. You can't look at that bird with a long pointy beak and say, oh, that's meant to break heavy nuts like a macaw parrot, for example, right? Now you look at a parrot and you look at a parrot that's got a giant, their, their mastication muscles are extremely strong. They have a beak that will, you know, uh, clip off your finger. You look at that, you know that that's not a bird that's going to go chill on the side of the beach and pick out shrimp. That bird is meant to eat nuts you know, heavy nuts that its, that its beak is allowed to crack. So this notion that's come about that suddenly animal protein is bad, there is really not a single study that has been done. The studies that have been out there more talk about animal fat and not animal protein, you know. So we do know for sure that if you're consuming high amounts of saturated animal protein without other things, it has higher risk of cardiovascular disease and so on, cancer even. But that's not the discussion. If we're going to compare apples to apples, we need to compare. The, no study has ever shown that if you're having a lean protein, right, lean protein, that causes any type of a cancer. And what's happening is that somebody jumps on this notion of plants are great, now they start making a bunch of hyper, hyper process that they call plant, except none of those have been studied either. And there are many indications that when you look at their ingredients, they're so processed that they're worse off than any other animal protein or fat. You know, when you look at, I just posted it the other day, you know, someone uh, took a, a picture of me at, they were at the store and it's like a bottle and it says just egg, right? Big just egg, and it says vegan made from pea proteins. So I have no idea where, you know, but if you say this is just egg and you say there is no egg in it and it's made out of pea protein, why is it called just egg? Now you look at that ingredient list. I usually, when I look at something that has just egg, the ingredient should be just one thing, right? Eggs. The ingredient list on the back of that thing was 30 things long. Half of it, you wouldn't be able to pronounce. And there's sugars, there's starches, everything hyper, hyper processed. Now, someone that doesn't know looks at this like, oh my God, I'm having a plant-based product. Except the studies that have been done, whether epidemiological or non, 
those studies have been about whole plants. Yes. And that's what keeps getting missed yes. is that you having some ultra processed cheese because you know, 17 steps ago may have been a plant material does not mean you're having broccoli right now, hey. you know, and that's what, that's, that's the issue is that, and, you know, we'll get on to the game changer in a minute, but I just wanted to start out with that. It's so true, man. I mean, I mean, like, you know, you get these burgers and these cheeses, all these vegan products, but it's, that's not vegetable. You know, that, that's like 17 different chemical processes, like you said, to put it together and to make it taste. Go, like look, at, go look at the ingredients for like the Beyond Meat burger or any of the like the stuff. There is so many stuff in there. There's so much in there. And, you know. Might as well eat a hot dog. If you have a solid 100% beef hot dog, you know, especially the organic ones, like, you know, Apple make, Applegate, I think, makes a great one that... You know, they, I would take that any day over something. You know, what we know, uh, Sam, is when you look at the healthiest cultures in the world, um, whether they're in Japan, whether they're in Scandinavia, you know, the Mediterranean, uh, in which, you know, many studies have been done about the Mediterranean diet, is that they eat a little bit of everything, which kind of alludes to what you were saying at the beginning. Uh, none of those people are on the either extremes. And usually... The reason it's called extreme is because it is that. It is not the norm. And, you know, you look at Mediterranean. They have lamb. They have beef. They have chicken. But they have lots of plant-based stuff. And no, they're not getting it out of a box. They're not getting it out of a bag. It doesn't come out of a wrapper. It doesn't come out of a bottle. When they eat the plants, they eat the plants the way it came out of the ground. And that's the whole point is that if you if you're gonna say I'm plant based or I'm 100% plant based, be plant based because what you're having, you know, like in that game changer, there's part of it where they're showing these bodybuilders eating like cheese, you know, lasagna and pizza and burritos, and plant. <laughs> that that they're that they're you know they're not saying it, but they're saying like, look, these are all these great plant. Those are crap. If you think that you're gonna have a vegetarian pizza and you think those ingredients are solid and they're not loaded with processed carbs and everything else and you somehow think that that's healthy and that's the message that you're portraying to people that's what kind of bothered me about um that entire it makes total sense look you know plant is not going to taste like animal protein and animal protein is not going to taste like plant you know you know taste don't try to don't try to make one the other yes instead yes. of just saying i think so you want to jump into the game changers? You want to jump into the game changers? Let's do it, man. Let's do it. We've been talking you know, about it. Here we go, man. Put your gloves. Yeah, so with game changers. So we'll start with that because I've got so many calls about this from my own patients, my friends. They know how much I'm into, you know, health and nutrition. And, oh, I watched that thing and I was just cringing from beginning to end, right? So, and what, what makes it disturbing that it's so well done. Right? That's the thing about it. Hollywood production, baby. It's, I mean, it's James Cameron, right? This guy made Terminator. You know, he made the Titanic. He made Avatar. I mean, we believe there were, you know, I was watching Avatar. Like, I'm like, I think there's probably Avatar in real life. You know, I believe it. <laughs> so if he can make that happen, of course, he's going to do an amazingly produced film. Not documentary. I refuse to call that a documentary. It's a film. It's a movie right? That's what it is. And the fact that we, we, we have to know that James Cameron um, has close to a quarter, mil, a quarter billion dollar invested into a pea protein company, that should automatically raise your flag of why he would do this. So well, I didn't know that. So, so the guy who made the movie, the director, you know, who made also the Terminator, you know, the Avatar. Yeah, if you look at, yeah, he's, he's, I think, $200 million into a pea protein company. He's like a major investor. Oh, there, 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 there it goes, man. One thing I've learned, here's one thing that I learned in, in college. And when I was in college, you know, they said that, you know, it has to be university tested double blind placebo study for you to even say it, you, to be able to take it seriously. So you got to always look at the source of the study or the source of who is producing it. I never looked at that in, in this. I case. really urge if, if, if your viewers, if you have not seen Game Changer, 
I want you to go see it. Like, I want you to go see it. So the points that are being brought up in this film that I addressed, you can at least refer back to, that it doesn't seem one-sided. And I'm going to give it a chance. And there's some, some you know, 20% of what it says is true, I'll say. But what happens is that, that doesn't say much. We don't go by that. And so, you know, Game Changer is basically about this MMA fighter who gets injured and decides like, okay, I'm going to do some research or whatever. And, the, and, and he supposedly does a thousand hours of research and somehow became an expert subject matter, which I kind of have an issue with that to begin with. Listen, you know, I've done like several years of physics as part of my pre-med studies, right? But if I went and sat and read a thousand hours of astrophysics, I'm still not any smarter. I don't know any more about astrophysics than I started because you have to have a foundation and understanding. Like they don't just throw you on the wards the first day of internship. You took you know four years of pre-med, four years of medical school, knowing chemistry, anatomy, physiology, biochemistry, every aspect before you able to even make a comment about a single thing. So how we go from an MMA fighter, he, and mind you, a thousand hours, just to kind of give you an idea, is a ridiculous amount of hours. And now he's out there saying that, no, he's actually done 3,000 hours. So if you actually, assuming he had no job, no other responsibilities in life, and he sat there four hours a day and actually retained 100% of what he read, and mind you, this is not, you know, he's not reading, you know, Mickey Mouse. He's reading highly detailed research papers. So four hours is, for me, when I'm looking at a research paper, about an hour of it, and I'm done because you gotta be, have time to be able to actually digest that information, look at the data, maybe look up some references and so on. If he did that four hours a day, a thousand, it would take him 250 days, seven days a week. That means he researched for a year. And it still doesn't mean that now suddenly he's a, an MD or PhD or an expert in that. You could do that for 3000 hours. It doesn't make you, you know, if you're reading the wrong stuff. And the problem in this society is that if you believe the earth is flat, guess what? You can get on the internet and I'll, you can find plenty of information that supports that theory, that the earth is flat. So there is, just because he found something that supported, you know, we have biases that, you know, that we internally have for whatever reason. And there's plenty of information out there that supports your bias. Now, whether that information out there is false or not is a whole different story, but it starts out with him researching this stuff and he realizes, okay, I just need to get into plant-based. So they talk about this researcher, which I'm not sure, this is kind of like from right off the bat where they lost me, is they talk about gladiators and that gladiators back in the day had a plant-based diet. And why? Because they found this researcher, the researcher went and dug up some gladiator bones out of this gladiator cemetery and they studied the bone and they saw that there was a you know, high deposition of strontium, which means that they had a lot of plant-based material. So they go from, and then, but then the researcher also talks about that, well, gladiators ate what they had around them, depending on what parts of the, where they lived. And there was plenty of other bones that showed that they had a lot of sulfur content, which means they ate meat. So, but then they, again, what they do is they throw out these little tidbits of information and then they jump to this massive conclusion. You know, it's like saying, if the last three hurricanes that hit Florida happened on a Thursday, that's like me saying like Thursdays are really bad. We should just skip Thursdays in a week because Thursday is just a bad day. Without, and, and just me stating that fact, hey, three hurricanes happened on a Thursday, and then I suddenly just jump and say Thursday is a bad day. That's kind of like what they do. So they make this notion that, Hey, since gladiators ate plants, and let's just assume that, a lot of plant-based stuff, that must be a great thing, and that's what we should do. What is not addressed is that, first of all, and you listen, we love gladiators, you know, we all watched the gladiator and Russell Crowe. Gladiators did not look like that, by the way. You could look at any drums. Gladiators were fat, obese, out of shape. Gladiators were slaves. Let's not forget this. Gladiators were slaves and they were, they fought for entertainment. And if they fought enough, you know, one out of a thousand after 10 years of fighting or whatever would, would win their freedom. So 
yes, the slaves were not having flame yawn 2000 years ago, <laughs> right? I mean, just, I mean, so, I mean, it's stuff like this that just drives me insane of why do we, I mean, like, so, you know, you know, you know how like when a witness gets on a stand and if they make a couple of lies, the prosecutor or defense is like, listen, we're going to have to strike this entire testimony because if half of what you say is a lie, now I can. so that's what happens is that they do have some decent information that, hey, plants are great and so on. And great, great. But what happens now when you're overreaching and you throw information to make this leap that does not exist, now you just lose credibility. So they, so they basically make this notion that, hey, gladiators, except what they don't talk about is that gladiators were slaves. Gladiators were fed. They had large amounts of them. They needed to feed large amounts of calories to sustain their energy. A lot of gladiators, um, they uh, packed on a lot of body fat because that's what, you know, when they were getting slashed and cut, you know, if you got cut in adipose tissue, you don't bleed as much than if you're muscular and you got cut on your pectoris. But if you had two inches of fat on you, you didn't die. Yeah, it sucked and you got cut. You know, in operations, you know, someone, you know, you cut through fat and there's literally no blood. You know, you, you may get a little bit of trickle of blood just from the skin capillaries, but fat itself pretty much has no, you know, blood supply. So um, a lot of the gladiators back then, that's why they were overweight, is because they wanted to pack on the fat uh, for those purposes. And again, the gladiators, do we want to uh, model ourselves after gladiators or what they were doing 2,000 years ago? I mean, we also thought bloodletting was a great thing in the 1900s. We don't do that anymore. I mean, up to the 1980s, even 90s, you know, they promoted single joint exercises and you'll know, do arms today, chest tomorrow. And now we know that, hey, compound exercises are much better. So just because somebody did something 2,000 years ago and to bring that almost at the opening of your film to everybody make that assumption everybody wants to glad everybody's a warrior these days everybody wants to be a gladiator these days everybody wants to be a you know fighter and they that's why they made that and that's why and that's why they made that to say hey these guys were a bunch of badasses and to be a badass you should eat plants but they skip all that information that i just gave you yeah so they go on and on in this movie about why like animal protein gives you cancer, why animal protein does this. And every time they mention anything that is remotely true, they make another jump or a conclusion, you know, where, you know, one thing that is, and again, everybody has a different uh, goal in what they're doing. You know, there are people that are just, they may not even be very active. They just want to have a healthy lifestyle. There are some people that are, you know, athletic or athletes, or they want to actually build lean muscle. And they make this notion that, listen, you can do it the exact same way. You know, you can get the same amount of, it's all about carbs. It has nothing to do with protein. And you can get the same amount of protein uh, from plants that you can get from animal. And, and that's just not factually correct. Because there's two, there's two points to be made about this. One is that Assuming you could even get the same amount of protein per gram, what is very hard to get is all the essential amino acids from plants. Now, are there plants that have essential amino, essential amino acids? Absolutely. Um, but you have to complement them to get the complete profile. So it makes it more complicated. Once again, this is a subject that this topic is not about that veganism can't be done the right way or you can't be a vegetarian and not do the right way. It does make it more complicated. You have to be very well aware that, hey, if I'm having uh, you know, a bunch of lentils, and mind you, I eat lots of lentils. I love lentils. But if you're going to have lentils and you, let's say but you're 100% plant-based, you have to know you have to now complement, okay, what is this lentil lacking that I can go do this? Whereas, and listen, if you have an egg, it's a complete spectrum protein. It's got everything right? It's got everything. Um, and many times it ends up requiring much higher calories. So if you are someone that is calorie restricted, you are going to have a harder time getting the same amount of protein. And then we're talking about, listen, protein is not protein. One gram of protein 
from one source does not equal one gram of protein from another source. And we're not talking, and particularly for people that are athletes. Biological value and protein efficiency ratios, right? Yes, 100%. You know, particularly your essential amino acids, um, you know, such as, let's say, you know, we know how anabolic leucine is, right? Most studies that have been done show that for you to put yourself in an anabolic state, you need at least two grams of leucine to be incorporated with your meal. Except, and, and we can, you know, and they talk about, oh my God, you can get the same uh, protein from a peanut butter sandwich, then you can get three ounces of uh, beef, which is, is kind of hogwash, right? So yes, if you have two tablespoons of peanut butter, which let's say has six to eight grams of protein, and you have two slices of bread, that have you know four or five grams of protein each slice of bread, you now have, let's say 16 to 18 grams of protein, right? Now, three ounces of a 90% lean ground beef. I'm not gonna talk about a lean cut like a steak, sirloin or filet, or even grass fed, which is even better. I'm talking about ground beef 90-10. Um, that in three ounces has 19, 20 grams of protein, a couple of grams more, but here's the difference. That only have, was 160 calories, so three ounces was 160 calories. Your peanut butter sandwich is going to be almost double that, and that peanut butter sandwich is going to have 0.5 grams of leucine, right? Let's just even say they both have the same total protein. They both have 18, 19 grams of protein, but your peanut butter sandwich had twice the calories, had half a gram of leucine, your three ounces of lean ground beef have three grams of leucine. Just three ounce of it has three grams of leucine. They're not the same. They're not the same. You know, so these, these are the issues. So, so they make that general statement. And for someone, you know, for the 95% of the population that watches that, they're like, well, I can have the same protein from a peanut. And listen, I love peanut butter sandwich, right? I look, give me a peanut butter sandwich and a glass of goat milk and I'm happy, right? But to say that they're identical or they're the same or they have the same health benefits, it would be ludicrous, you, you know? So that's, and, and they do this throughout the entire show. Hey guys, if you like today's episode, do me a huge favor, go ahead and leave a comment below, subscribe to the channel, leave me a review, and tag a few friends that you think can benefit from what we share today. Really appreciate it, God bless.